Today we continue our series entitled Sold Out. If you weren't able to join with us uh, last weekend, we began a series called uh, Sold Out. And it's basically just an opportunity, a series about what it means to live a life sold out to Jesus. And we're walking through uh, the book of Acts chapter by chapter for a number of weeks because we think it's the perfect companion to this series entitled Sold Out because it's all about how the disciples in the early church learned to embed, learned to integrate certain disciplines, certain practices into their life in an effort to be sold out to the ministry that Jesus passed on to them before he was ascended to heaven. So last week, we looked at how we need to be sold out to, come on, type it in the box, sold out to prayer, yes. And we did that by what? Cultivating a habit of prayer. And we did that by two things. Remember, it was pray what you've got, good, and pray where you are. And we did that, why? Because ultimately, prayer releases the presence of God. Great. Three people watched church last week. That totally validates me. Um, Well, this week, uh, we're going to look at how we need to be sold out to the Holy Spirit. And I want to spend the remainder of my time today really just answering three questions. First question is, who is the Holy Spirit? The second question is, why do we need the Holy Spirit? And thirdly, what does a life sold out to the Holy Spirit even look like? So if you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn with me as we read our text today. It's from chapter 2 of Acts. It's a pretty lengthy text, so stay with me, stay focused, uh, because there's some good stuff in here. Let's read verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Perithians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia... Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now he quotes from the Old Testament. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great day and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Now let's skip down to verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So who is the Holy Spirit? If I was to ask you in person who the Holy Spirit was, and you've been around church circles for some time, I'm sure you would give me an answer that went something like this, that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And you would be correct. But I think it's important to unpack a little deeper today who the Holy Spirit really is, because I think it helps frame why it's so important to be sold out to the Holy Spirit. So why don't you turn with me to the very first mention of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, to the very first chapter, to the very first book, to the very first couple of verses of the Bible. It's Genesis 1, verse 1 to 2. It says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now the word for the Spirit of God, or the Holy Spirit, in ancient Hebrew is actually three words. It's ruach hakodesh. Now the first word ruach, you kind of have to pretend that you're like trying to clear your throat. Ruach is the word for spirit, but it actually has a number of concurrent meanings. As in in Hebrew, there's actually a number of things that it means, and it's identified or it's um, designed that all of the meanings will be held concurrently as it's heard. So not only does it mean spirit, but it also means breath, it means wind, It means movement of air. It means life-giving energy. Now, there's no coincidence in Acts, the scripture that we just read, that when the Holy Spirit comes and settles on the disciples' heads in tongues of fire, that it says that suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Ruach is not just spirit, it's breath. It's wind, it's energy that's unseen. The second word is the word ha. And the word ha is just the definite article. It's what we would just translate in English as the. The third word is kadesh. And kadesh means holy. Now, not morally holy, but holy in the sense of set apart or separate to. You see, the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh, in Hebrew, is very much understood as the set-apart or the holy, personal, tangible presence of Yahweh. The life-giving breath or wind of God Himself. It was this idea of God's Word, God's breath, God's presence in action. And so this forms the foundation of why it's so critical to be sold out to the Holy Spirit. It's because the Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God's presence and power. The Holy Spirit is the manifestation, the tangible outworking of God's breath, of God's Word, of God Himself here on earth and in all creation. You see, last week, we looked at how prayer releases God's power. How prayer is the mechanism that invites the breath of God into our lives and situations. But it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Ruach HaKodesh that makes that power, that makes that breath made manifest, made tangible, actually present and tangible in our lives. You see, last week we saw 
when Daniel was in the lion's den, that through prayer, he invited the presence and the power of God into his situation. But it was the Ruach HaKadosh, the manifestation of God's breath, of God's presence, of God's power, that was what tangibly held the lion's mouths shut. Turn back with me to today's scripture, and Peter himself highlights what's possible, what happens when the manifestation of God's presence, God's power is made tangible here on earth. You see, Peter quotes from the book of Joel in the Old Testament, and he says this, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. You see, Luke wants his hearers to know that when the Holy Spirit the Ruach HaKadosh, the manifestation of God's breath, God's very personal presence breaks out into earth that anything is possible, that the prophetic is possible, that young men, young women who don't have life experience through the outbreaking and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit can have revelation, can have vision that old men, Though feeling decrepit, though, though you know, not having the vitality of life, through the outworking, the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit, are able to dream dreams, are able to cast vision. In fact, in Genesis, in verse 3, where we stopped, it said just after where it says, and the Holy Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. It says this, it says, Then God said, let there be light. Then God said, let there be moon. Then God said, let there be animals. Then God said, let there be all this stuff. Then God said, are you picking this up? It's God's breath. It's the manifestation of God's breath that brings the whole of the universe into being. It's the Holy Spirit, the manifestation, the personal presence of God that brings the universe into existence. And it's this same presence and power that was used to speak the universe into being that's ready and waiting to manifest in your life, to bring freedom, to bring healing, to restore broken relationships, to bring provision in the face of loss of income, to bring hope when feelings or situations would make us feel hopeless. You see, we need to be sold out to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God's presence and power here and now in our lives today. Church, I don't know where you are at today. I don't know whether or not you feel like you're on top of the mountain or whether you feel like you're buried under a million feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. But can I tell you this? Your answer won't be found in avoiding the situation. Your answer won't be found in self-medicating. Your answer won't be found in distracting yourself or in comfort. It's found in the Ruach HaKadosh. It's found in the manifestation, the tangible outworking of God's presence and power in your life. The second reason we need to be sold out to the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit is God's redemptive witness to humanity. Think about it. If the ultimate goal 
And this is what we say it is in our church community. If the ultimate goal for us is to be sold out to this life-transforming relationship in Jesus, to be a part of continuing the ministry that he began, being part of God's redemptive rule here on earth, being salt and being light, then it's paramount that we are sold out to allowing the Holy Spirit to breathe in and through our lives. Not just so we can experience God's power, God's presence, and God's provision, but so that we, through the Spirit's breath, may be witnesses to God's loving and saving power. You see, last week, we looked at how when Jesus was farewelling his disciples just before he's ascended to heaven. Some of his disciples excited at the new revelation that he unequivocally is the son of God. They say to Jesus, great, are we going to storm Rome now? Are you going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? And Jesus goes, no, 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 you've missed a point. And he tells them that they will receive power, that they will receive the Ruach HaKodesh. Why? So that they can be witnesses here in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the ends of the earth. You see, the point of God's presence and power being made manifest in our lives is more than just about us. It's about the Holy Spirit breathing in and through us as a witness to the saving love and grace of God. You know, I have a three-year-old son, for those of you who might be streaming with us for the first time. Amazing kid, love him to death. Basically think of a kind-hearted Tasmanian devil, and that's kind of what he's like, full of energy. And at the moment, having just turned three, he has in his mind that he is physically stronger than his mum, than my wife, Bianca. I don't know why he thinks this, but he legit, like he cannot be told, I argue with him, he cannot be told. He's like, no, I am stronger than mum. You know, dad's the strongest, then me, then mama, and then he, some kid from daycare rates a mention Carter, who he's also stronger than, he's quite happy about that. But I was thinking the other day, why is it when Bianca, my wife, is easy, three times bigger than him, and clearly far more stronger than him as a you know, fully built, grown woman, why is it that he thinks that he's stronger than his mum? And I began to reflect on the way that, you know, I engage with him and the way that Bianca engages with him. And all of a sudden, it became apparent. See, I want to show you a couple of clips of how I engage with my son. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, beaters! <laughs> Now I want to show you uh, a couple of clips of how Bianca engages with our son. Here we go. I know what that is. Now, can you notice anything off the bat? You see... When I engage with our son, I do it in ways that, um, uh, you know, are are very traditionally blokey, are manly. There's a, a real element of physicality. My physical strength is manifested in the way that I play with our son. And because my physical strength is manifested in the way that I interact and engage with our son, that acts as a witness to Zach that I am indeed strong. When Bianca engages and plays with our son, she doesn't manifest physical strength in the way that she engages. So there is no witness 
And for him at three, he's like, well, if there's no witness testifying to her strength, well, then there's no reason that I believe that she's strong. You see, if people are going to believe and be brought into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus, we need the Holy Spirit manifesting in our lives because the Holy Spirit is God's redemptive witness to humanity. The Holy Spirit manifesting or showcasing God's power, God's presence, God's breath in your life is more than just about you getting answered prayer or experiencing the miraculous. The Holy Spirit manifesting in and through your life is all about God's redemptive witness to humanity. It's God testifying to your work colleague that in Christ there is no condemnation. It's God testifying through you to your family that even though you walk through the shadow of death, God is with you. It's God testifying to that neighbor or to that special relationship in your life that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You see, we need the Holy Spirit in our life because the Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God's presence and power, but because the Holy Spirit is also God's redemptive witness to humanity. Now, at this point you might go, okay, that's awesome, Matt. But there's a third question for me that just kind of follows naturally. And that's, well, what does a sold out life to the Holy Spirit even look like? And I've got to preface this point by saying this. Preaching for me is very much a love-hate relationship. Many people tell me that I have a gift in preaching. And so there's an element of, you know, the, like anything else, when you're kind of gifted in it, there's an element of enjoying what you're doing. And that's true. But there's very much a hate part of the relationship in preaching for me. And it's all the stress, all the anxiety of the preparation. It's me happening to wrestle with God, be vulnerable with God, about all the things that I'm about to get up and preach and declare myself. And I've got to tell you, this week was no different. You see, as I was reflecting on my life about what it means to be sold out to the Holy Spirit, I've got to tell you, I was a little bit confronted when I discovered what a life sold out to the Holy Spirit really looks like. It looks like this. It's found in Galatians. 5 verse 22, where Paul, the Apostle Paul, spells out for us exactly what a life sold out to the Holy Spirit looks like. He says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, I love that word. The Greek for the word long-suffering is actually uh, it translated as um, passionately prepared to suffer for the sake of the other. Passionately prepared to suffer, to go without your preferences and your desires for the other. More fruit includes kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I've got to be honest, while I was thinking and preparing and wrestling through this sermon, I came to a dead end because there is just no two ways about it that if I don't see the fruit of gentleness, the fruit of kindness, the fruit of being prepared to suffer and go without my preferences for the sake of my wife, for the sake of my church colleague, for the sake of whoever. If I don't have faithfulness, if I don't have the fruit of peace in my life, 
than the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in my life and in my witness isn't what it could and should be. And I find that confronting. But the thing I love is that there is hope. You see, in verse 36 of our Scripture today, Peter says this, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? You know, maybe as I'm reading out the fruit of the Holy Spirit today, the Holy Spirit's convicting you. And there's a realisation that, yeah, you know what? It's probably not the level of gentleness in my life that there should be. It's probably not the level of peace or faithfulness or preparedness to go without my preferences and my desires for the sake of the other, as there probably should be. Matt, what should I do? Well, let me read to you what Peter replies. He says this, Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for, for the forgiveness of your sins. And what? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive afresh the Ruach HaKodesh the personal manifestation, the personal tangible presence of the God of the universe. You know what I love about this Scripture the most? It's like it was just written for me. Because Peter here isn't talking to a bunch of like, you know, dodgy heathens that don't believe in God. No, it actually said in the Scripture that we read that there were God-fearing Jews from all around the world that happened to be in Jerusalem. You see, Peter is preaching to God-fearing Jews right here. Peter is anticipating that even God-fearing Jews sometimes go stale in the manifestation of God's breath in their life. But the antidote is clear. Repent. And the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh will be yours again afresh today. You know, church, there is no two ways about it. If you cannot see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, the fruit of love, the fruit of kindness, the fruit of faithfulness and long suffering, all of the others, if you can't see that in your life, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit isn't what it could and should be. And I invite you today along with me to say, God, I repent. Forgive me, God, for not being gentle with my wife. Forgive me, God, for not being faithful to Your commands. Forgive me, God, for not being peaceful with my neighbour. Forgive me, God, for wanting my preferences and my desires over the people that I serve in ministry with or that I do life with. Would you forgive me? And I love that God's response is yes. And when you repent, I will give you afresh the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh.
the breath of God to again fill you, to again be tangible in your life, to again manifest in your life, in your circumstances, and through your life so you can be a witness to all that I'm doing. You know, church, if we have any hope of being sold out to Jesus, we need to be sold out to the Holy Spirit. We need to be sold out to constantly getting on our knees and saying, God, forgive me and pour in me afresh the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh, the gift of the Holy Spirit to manifest in my life, in my heart, in my situation, in my relationships once again. And I believe, church, that if we can do that faithfully, then we, we, we will truly see people in our community, people in our life, brought into a life-transforming relationship. But it starts with us. Let's pray. Oh, Holy Father, I'm so conscious of the fact that too often all my life, all that my life manifests is myself, is my selfishness, is my frailties, is my will and not yours. And God, I wanna pray today, would you come into my life? Would you come into every heart and every life that's represented through the people joining our stream right now? Because we just say, God, we're sorry. And we want to receive afresh your gift of the Holy Spirit. We want afresh for your Holy Spirit to manifest in our life. We want Your breath to again live and outwork in our life, both individually, but as our witness to Your saving love and Your saving power. Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, we just invite You this day. Would You come and fill us love you.